about where machinimas begin for each of us. When we're going to make a machinima, where does it begin for you? And what are the next steps that you go for? Shopping comes some way down the list, Dorian. <laughs> Not slightly, <laughs> slightly below begging again. <laughs> okay, Chantal, what about you? Well, in, Where does in, in big productions, we actually had a shopper, like you have a runner in, in the real life porn world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, Machinima begins most. I think always with an idea. You can, yeah, fantasy. You can stumble onto it, or the idea comes to you when you're, whatever you know, when you're under the shower or in world, or in the shops. But uh, the com you, it starts with an idea, I think. Uh, it can also be a poem or a storyline, or a fantastic visual that you run into. Or somebody will walk up to you with a story and say, oh, I always thought of. So it, it, it can start with many things. And for you, Huckleberry? So the question was, where does, where does the idea begin? Um, yeah, where does the machinery begin? I mean, I think for me, um, it begins in uh, an, uh, just an idea for a story, really. And um, but but more of a in in the case of film and machine and second life, more the the context for a story, perhaps. Um, I'd like to make something about this, or I'd like to make something about that, uh, and then um, the actual um, the actual plot, if, as it were. Um, then kind of organically grows around um, the places I find to film in, um, the things that I find that are doable or not doable, or the things that need some thinking about in order to make them doable. Um, so I guess for me, it, it kind of starts off as that gem of, of an idea and, um, and keeps on growing throughout the entire project. agree. I'd agree that yeah. it, for me, it starts with a story and then starts to grow from there. Um, and also for me, characters, because I'm tending to look at, a, at it, it's going to be a, a story and I want to explore the characters. So having an idea of who's going to play them and then starting to work with them to see how they see the characters, because ideas can be sparked off by the cast as well. Ash, you've worked with me like that. How yes, did you I'd, I'd say that you were um, very much an actor's director. Feel intuitive feel for what a character not necessarily should be, but uh, a direction that they might go, and then you leave a lot of room for the actor to fill in detail, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm with you. I, I like to have uh, a story as well, and beyond that, I like to have an application for the story, because that's my background, is sort of in applied things, in broadcast television, and uh, commercial stuff, and educational stuff, training stuff, so things that have a purpose. So. Uh, I love to see everyone doing uh, artistic applications because I've not done so much of that and I really like seeing it done. Mm. Yes, people like Tootsie. Mm -hmm. um, the surname I forget, but who does the most beautiful machinima, which is sometimes quite abstract. Dizzy, Dizzy Dinaccio, or Iono Allen. Yeah, the two as well. And I would say for me, 
I would say for me, the next stage is starting to gather the crew. The, well, the cast and the crew. Um, I agree, I, and that can be, at least it has been for me, the toughest part. And I suppose that's because I haven't been so much a part of the machinima, uh, machinima community here, which is something I've missed, I suppose. Um, but yeah, finding people who who are skilled at the kinds of things that need to be done can be difficult. Hmm. What about yes. you, Chuck? Yeah, casting is, is difficult. But, um, as you know, I worked with Tony Dyson, the R2D2 guy from Star Wars, and he looked uh, completely different upon making machinima. I'd been making machinima for probably 10 years when I started working with him. And he's worked in real life studios. He did James Bond, he did Star Wars, all these. So he sort of opened my eyes for a different way of looking at it and approaching it. Uh, everything had to be reproducible, leave nothing to chance, uh, organize, organize, and then you start shooting ac your actual movie. So what we did, I found with uh, actors, even if I found the perfect actors, once you start uh, your schedule and they don't show up, they use <laughs> internet or they make a mistake the wrong day or many, many things can happen. So to avoid that, I always make sure I have seconds, people on a reserve list that I can actually call in real life, I ask for people's phone number, and I make accounts for every actor. So the day that they help me filming, that's the day they get the password to the account, and the avatar is already set up. So yeah. Yeah, and the voice-over work is done uh, afterwards, I think. Uh, uh, Huckleberry, you work like that too, right? The voice work is done afterwards. Because you'd be surprised in real movies, the voice work is also done afterwards and not on the set. And most people in Second Life film the audio on set. They let the actors speak. I do that too to get a little bit of lip sync, but the actual voices are spoken in afterwards. So it's a different... Uh, well, but of course, there's many approaches. That's mine for now. Yeah. Habit, I think you don't, sorry, Huck, I think you don't actually kind of work with a script until after you've shot the content. Yeah, um, my, my approach is probably the, the least um, well organised of everybody um, <laughs> on this panel today. Um, I, I, I said earlier on about things kind of growing organically and, and, I, and I really do mean that. I don't, I don't start off with a script um, and I actually write the script it's one of the last things that I do um, and then I send the lines to my actors and ask them to record them having said that I, I, you know I've, I've done one machinima project with other actors so I'm probably also the least qualified person <laughs> to speak about this topic what I think is is kind of good for people here is to learn that there can be lots of different methods of doing it You know that that people get to things by the same way. I mean, in a sense, when we did the Black and Mirror, we followed very much a conventional Hollywood thing. I ju hang on just a sec. I've got something to upload to show you. Yeah, I think when you start in the beginning. You know, it doesn't matter where you start with. Uh, just start. Maybe it's a poem you really love or a song, and you I really find visuals to go with it. Thought it. That's a, I hope everyone that's a perfect a colored song. Mistake there of actually TPing away instead of pressing the build button. Oh, well, I thought I fill in the gap. I saw you disappear. <laughs> okay. Okay. So how many how many people do you see as as necessary for a team? Uh, 
I think a writer is essential and a director. And the director in the cinema is most often the filmer and the editor. Mm. But then film, you can't do it without good music and original music. So I think a basic team will quickly be 10, 10 people. That's if you want to do a movie. I have done little uh, short films uh, on my own. I just log into Extra Avatars and make sure I buy good animations that fit the storyline. So y you can do them on your own if, if necessary, if you want to play. I, th I think that's the way to start, actually. But that's an opinion. What about you? Um, well, in terms of in terms of recruiting um, actors, which just to go back to your earlier question, um, because um, Machinima was still something quite new to me when I started on Stonewall, I tend I really um, used the people that I knew already. Um, some of them because um, I really liked the way their avatar looked, and I thought that that would. I thought that a, a variant on on their look would work really, really well for the um, for the way I wanted the thing to look. There's a couple of people I'd heard in in voice, um, uh, Boudica Amat, uh, who I was reading here yesterday. I'd, I'd heard in voice, and I thought she would uh, be a really good voice actor. Uh, Anthony Westburn, um, who is a DJ, and I really liked his voice, uh, and so I asked him to play a role as well. Um, in terms of the, the, the kind of the crew around the, the more technical side of things, um, I am a bit of a control freak. I like to do most things myself um, because I want to be able to have that control over over every aspect of of how it looks and sounds. Uh, so I did um, the writing and the directing and the and the obviously the filming and the editing. Uh, I do have a friend in real life uh, who's very good at creating music so that was another person um, and uh, and Caitlin Tobias uh, who was one of the main roles in the film also took on a lot of the kind of publicity um, stuff uh, the promotion if you like um, so in the end I think it was a, a re I mean a, I think it was in terms of act actors and together um, I probably should know this off the top of my head but I want to say something like um, seven or eight people um, there's quite a few people involved in terms of in terms of extras but you know those are people who were around when I was filming and, and who gave their consent to be in in the film um, in in the project that I'm working on at the moment I think that's expanding ever so slightly uh, so I do have um, a friend Busy, who is um, has become very good at designing avatars. Uh, so she's she kind of does um, she has her own shapes business, but also she's just very good at putting um, outfits together and skins and uh, heads and and so on and so forth. Uh, so she's been designing a couple of, bes of bespoke avatars uh, for the the project, um, and um, I'm, I'm also. Uh, working with uh, Marina Munter from uh, the GBTH project and she's been providing some set space so that I can construct uh, some sets somewhere that I don't have to deconstruct every time every evening because you know it's like a you know four-hour sandbox or something like that so it's a slightly larger team um, now and and also um, whilst I'm continuing to use uh, the people that people that I know for, for actors I'm uh, that's not going to be the case for all of the projects and so um, I'm going to be probably putting out a casting call I imagine uh, in a few weeks time um, to expand the, the, the actors um, that's not something I've ever done before so um, personally not anything that I'm necessarily good at um, but you know, we'll see how that goes mm, I have quite a big community from uh, the Machinima Mondays meetings with a lot of people that were actors or musicians or even voice artists. But um, I did that. I did a call for actors. And uh, it, in the end, you know, we did a nice little film and it was never shown because one of the actors uh, changed their mind and got uh, a lot of trouble afterwards. So they, they said, well, I will not have this film shown because I'm in it and I don't agree with it. In hindsight, blah, blah, blah. So unless okay. we... Real content. It's 
That's why I work with acting accounts that I let people log into. I credit everybody and everything. I credit, uh, if possible, the, the guy that makes the flowers or sets or whatever, but um, I'm, I, I'm careful because of that. Mm. I find it. I like drama we can have sometimes. I, I think um, in going forward, one of the things I'm going, going to get people to do is essentially sign a release contract before I do anything yeah. so that um, people Contracts. have basically agreed that we can, uh, whatever happens, we can show the film and we can show it to in writing, yes. That would be. In writing, yeah. Must be real. There are ownership issues that need to be yeah. worked out. Especially when you've worked collectively and one person can just sink the whole thing. Right. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we ought to have a standard contract if we can get something together and we could share it amongst. Um, people so that everyone had the same contract and no one would think it was unduly oppressive because everyone made you sign it, if you see what I mean. Yeah, that would be yeah. useful. Mm -hmm. I'd have to add to the crew list, um, Huckleberry, you seem to, to do your own, but someone to handle uh, set construction, mm -hmm. props, all that sort of thing. Bravo you for doing it yourself, <laughs> but yeah, if if one can have a bespoke person for doing that, mm. actor doesn't have to. I, uh, I, was... I, I tend to use um, I tend to use locations that um, you know, regions that already exist, uh, which which is of course problematic because often locations only exist for they're only open for you know four to six weeks. Um, partly for that reason, I, I, I have started designing um, a, a couple of sets. I am doing that myself at the moment, <laughs> along with everything else. Um, but it would make a lot of sense um, to have somebody who, you know, who was particularly skilled at that. I will add that um, Stonewall was made on more or less no budget. Um, so cost is all, also, um, you know, an, an issue. Uh, I love I love the idea of, of setting up different accounts um, and then having kind of more than one person on standby to use um, those accounts. But just thinking about the cost of of, uh, of bodies and heads and skins and and outfits that that sounds like um, quite a cost commitment. It can be if you need uh, a multi character uh, action. But then. What kind of cost do you talk about? 10,000 lindens maybe, or 20,000, if you confirm that to real life money? It's not a lot, yeah. In, in lindens, in linden terms, um, it can stack up, but in, in real life money, it's certainly a whole lot less than you could get by with in the real world, or even in uh, other virtual worlds, I suspect, because uh, marketplaces elsewhere charge so much more than, than SL Marketplace does. Uh, I was thinking, um, Mr. Biggins, who is a, a standby character in Designing Worlds and the Black and Mirror, I think we've all been Mr. Biggins in our time, haven't we? Uh, yeah. Have you escaped, Ash? Did you ever get into Mr. Biggins? Uh, no, I don't think I... Well, maybe once. Maybe once. Um, and I'm not sure if I was Mr. Biggins or his brother. So <laughs> one of the Biggins boys, I think I may have been at one point. Yes, we've all been the Biggins boys. Uh, but we, yes, um, starting with the productions we did at Fantasy Fair, the stage production, we actually have a whole gang called Actor. So we've got Alpha Actor and Beta Actor and Gamma Actor. Yes, Tara, who's in the audience, was uh, has been big in too. Started at Fantasy Fair, those uh, that troop. Of yeah, the the fair was where we started having these kind of set actors. Who, yeah, we've now got about ten. 
and they're very good. We use them uh, in the Shakespeare productions, if I remember yeah. right. Yeah. And we put them. I think I've used one or two as well in other things because it's just. I think when we did Murder at the Mersham Durkin for Designing Worlds, Arthur Actor got murdered. Um, but the yes, talking about your set design thing, I found people have been very generous, like um, Pandemonium, uh, yeah. Pandora Quintessa, actually cleared her sit, her region, so that we could film over a weekend the asylum sequences, and Ash had been the set designer and had done the cell, the spooky laboratory and the sitting room. And I think Loki Elliot came in and designed a very, very scary Cthulhu temple. Or it might have been Sorry. there. And uh, but things like the marshes and the ruin were already there as part of Quintessa's region and it was brilliant that she allowed us to do that. It really was, and because uh, it was her strength. Agent designers, yeah, yeah, they, they can be a great resource if you approach them in a respectful sort of way and say, "I I love what's here. If if I can work around your schedule, um, can we film here?" And frequently, I think you'll you'll come up with a yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, good stuff from the audience, some really good remarks. Um, I, I was going to say that someone else who's vital to the crew that I've worked with is uh, the special effects guy, who is Terra Bolitant in the audience. And... Uh, also our scripture for the quest, by the way. Yes. Multi-talented fellow. Yeah. And he did the, um, in season one of Black and Mirror, he was doing things like bodies falling through mirrors and uh, landing on the floor and climbing back up again and uh, working out ways of scripting things so that they looked cool on screen. And then in season two, discovering Re-Scene, which is one of the choreography huds in effect, so that you can actually set action points so that you can film scenes like not just the complicated special effects scenes, but things as simple as people walking down the street, stopping and having an argument which took us forever to film in season one and could have been done, you know, in a couple of hours with this. Oh, do you remember that scene we tried to get the plant to spit po pollen all over Mr. Biggins? Yes. And just get, you know, he pointed at the plant, it spat, but we just could never get the sequence right. We had to film again and again and again. Timing uh, animation in Second Life relative to anything else, yeah, can be. Yeah. It has been very difficult. Yeah, but it's, once you use those hats, life becomes so much easier. Yes, Tara said. So, okay, we've got a crew. Uh, we've got everyone to sign um, contracts, simple contracts that basically say we can use what you do. And then we start filming. And I'm sure some of you who may not have done this before wonder how. We do the actual filming.
Chantal, what do you use? I'm a big lover of fraps, but uh, any screen recording software can record Second Life when you're running it. Uh, mm. Fraps has a very big advantage. I bought it, I think, about 12 years ago, if not longer, for 30 pounds, mm. and it's still that. It's still that price, 30, 35. It's lifelong with free updates, and the biggest plus of it is it uh, records in raw material, so not MP4 or MPEG or any other format, but in the actual raw material. So, yeah. Uh, you need a lot of space on your computer, but it's wonderful. It's the best. But Camtasia uh, has a big advantage. I use that for a while. You can edit with it. I edit with Adobe. But you can edit with Movie Maker, with any editing software. So it's a bit to your personal liking. But again, Fraps has the big advantage that it's raw material. Yeah. What about you, Pak? What do you use? Um, so I use Fraps as well. Um, just to go down the route of, of zero budget uh, once again, I actually, uh, for Stonewall, I actually use the free version of Fraps, uh, which allows you to create up to 30 second uh, clips. Ah. I have since then gone on to, to buy the full version, uh, which I'm using at the moment. Um, I And for free um, video editors, I use Lightworks, uh, which you can, there's, there's a, like a paid version and a free version. Uh, the paid version is a is a monthly subscription, I think, um, which um, for the for the few extra features you get, that's that's not something um, that I particularly want to to go in for. Um, I, I also the, the the I agree that Fraps is great because it records um, raw video files, and uh, and obviously one of the, one of the issues that you're up against when you're filming in Second Life is frame rate. Uh, and so really, uh, you know, you want to get as, as good a frame rate as possible because uh, everything in Second Life conspires to bring your frame rate down. So I want my machine to be doing as, as little work on the actual business of recording uh, as possible and not obviously encoding stuff into, into some kind of a codec on the fly. But I do then use um, Handbrake, uh, which is a kind of a, a video encoding tool. Um, to then to then bring the file sizes down because obviously when you, you it doesn't take very long recording video at full uh, you know in, in raw file size before you start to fill up your hard disk um, and um, you know rather than have to you know, delete uh, clips that you've um, that you've uh, that you've used previously um, you know or, or just bits of them I like to keep as much old footage as possible uh, so it's it's that combination of uh, of Fraps and uh, Handbrake, which is also free, I should add, and then Lightworks for the editing. Um, yes, a couple of people are mentioning one that's come out recently, which is open source called OBS Studio. Um, it's free and open source, and it's actually for a lot more than just recording, as Tara says, so it has a learning curve, but it's very powerful and useful. I use that for streaming when I do the streaming sessions. And actually, Strawberry uh, uh, Singh or Linden has done a really good mm -hmm. on how to use it step for step. It has recently been updated, so it's a little different, but you have to sit down for it and, you know, just look into it for about an hour and you will know what to do. But Twitch streamers, as Terra says, uh, Twitch doesn't allow you to stream Second Life. You'll be banned for life if they find out. Mm. Oh no, it's bad. But yeah. yeah. Well, I use Fraps. I'd like to learn the OBS system, and I may may well do that my next project but uh, we will do a session at Machinima Mondays just about streaming yeah, studios. That would be good. message so that you can join if you want yeah and the other thing that uh, okay I'm going to fess up now I'm actually I have the Adobe um, kit so I use Premiere mm. for um, I use Premiere 
uh, um, editing. And I love it. I love it. I love it to bits. Uh, yeah, it's not an option for everyone because it's bloody expensive. <laughs> It is. I actually still have the, the one on CD, the last one they brought out on CD in like 2006. <laughs> but it's yes. still... So I don't need to buy the uh, subscription every month. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I um, That may be available I somewhere on eBay, for example, if someone yeah. is looking for a copy of an, of an older version of Premiere, you can maybe find it there. Yeah. That's a good tip. Yeah. I, I mean, started work in Premier Two back yeah. in nineteen ninety five. And it was wonderful, but God it was heavy. Uh perhaps it's for filming and um, Premiere is I use for editing. I don't you can't really film in Premiere Pro. It doesn't capture. No, it, it doesn't uh, capture. It just it edits, yeah. But it, it's, it's lovely for editing. And uh, Adobe periodically run courses that can help you do things. And uh, actually, if I put up the screen, would you like to see a short piece I made for my Adobe course? And uh, they had always been dealing with real life films, people bring, doing that as part of their course. And I, mine was the first second one, second life one they ever saw. And they just, they were really complimentary about it. Uh, let me just show you okay to talk talk among yourselves while i set this up it can only take a couple of minutes but please talk among yourselves so huckleberry what do you use to edit Uh, I use Lightworks, uh, which is a, a video a video editing application. Oh, I'm making notes because <laughs> the although the old Adobe old version works good, uh, of course it doesn't do what the modern edit software does. But I'm so addicted to Adobe that it feels like home. Anybody well, else in the audience has tips for editing software? Because I want to edit in 4K. I don't know if Sony Vegas can handle 4K, um, but that's another one that's out there that uh, I've seen people use and is mm. popular with its users, I believe. Uh, I think is that for a PC or? Uh, yeah, I believe yeah. so. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's a Mac port, uh, but I know that it is for PC. Yes. Okay. Lauren says that the new Sony does indeed do 4K. Okay. Oh, and that's a great link. I'm, I'm reading um, in local chat because uh, I think it's important to get it into the recording. Huckleberry's just created a series of tutorials on how he makes Machinima, including his software. Oh, that's brilliant. And, and there's a link here that I won't read because, boy, that would be a mess. But <laughs> perhaps we can post it uh, along with the, the video of this. I'm making notes like crazy here. <laughs> We all have our own way of doing it, so we can learn. Yeah. yeah. It was part of my own learning process to, to create those tutorials because um, I was essentially learning how to do Machinima whilst I was doing Machinima. So uh, a way of consolidating that learning was for me to then to try and teach it, if you like. And, and so I wrote, um, I wrote those um, articles over a period of a few months. It's a great idea. Mm 
movie studio. That's a little room. Well, I'm making notes here. The Penumbra makes a lot of really great machinima. She makes the art machinima we were talking about earlier on. Her uh, machinimas are quite different from what most people do, I will admit. <laughs> uh, movie studio is some magic. I'll quickly add that one of the one of the advantages um, for using Lightworks is that there's quite a big community of people who've developed um, kind of third-party plugins for for Lightworks. So there's quite a range of video effects that you can um, obtain. I think they're pretty much all for free um, and, and and use on your production. I didn't use that many of them um, myself, but uh, there's a whole load out there. And you mentioned an encoder handbrake. I always use Format Factory. Have you tried that? I haven't. No, I, I did um, originally use um, a tool called iFrame, which is custom written for Lightworks. Because um, Lightworks occasionally, has, if if you try to import raw movie files into Lightworks, it can it can stumble on those. Uh, so I used um, I used iFrame. Um, for all of Stonewall, in fact, and really the main reason I've gone over to Handbrake is that the the file size of the um, re-encoded files is is incredibly small, uh, and so you know because because hard disk space is always an issue, um, that that becomes quite a pressing need for me. So um, that's mainly the reason why I use Handbrake, um, and so far it seems to be pretty good. Yes, I've used Handbrake and it does seem very good indeed. I've never even heard of it, so that's interesting enough to to explore. Yeah, I use Format Factory once you find something that works. But don't you find the quality goes down? Um, well, when I was when I was changing to use Handbrake, that was obviously one thing that I was concerned about because when I saw how small the files were. I thought, well, then, then, then must be that there must be some compromise happening somewhere. Um, all I can say is that, you know, to my naked eye, they appear to be uh, just as good as the as the original raw footage. So I don't I don't really understand what kind of um, tomfoolery is going on behind the scenes. Having said that, um, you know, it I, I, you know I, I guess it depends upon the way in which files are compressed, and and a lot of my scenes tend to be still shots with a little bit of movement in them. So, you know, I, and I do understand that, that um, some compression techniques, what they'll do is they'll look at a, a piece of footage and they'll, you know, basically they, if nothing's changing, then, then they won't record anything in that frame uh, for that. So I, I guess that possibly the reason why Handbrake produces so small files is because sorts of footage that I'm creating is, is, is if you like, almost optimized for that because there's there's quite a bit in a scene that, that might not be changing from frame to frame yeah you could be well right i found actually had problems with uh, the moving scenes if i hook the camera to the avatar and make them run and turn the corners then then you get the best quality here's the piece that i made for my adobe course um, I thought you might like to have a look. So we just click the screen. Just click the screen and click play. For some reason the button isn't working. Ah, there we go.
sorry, I may have taken that away too quickly. <laughs> I hope everyone got to the end. I'm on the space, pricey space navigator, I'm afraid. But I would like to advocate for static shots. <laughs> static shots can do a whole lot. You can't, it's yeah. great if you can move your camera, but you don't have to. Mm. Agreed. Yeah, I would advocate for static shots as well. Um, I, I think sometimes the navigators use a little bit too much. Um, I do have a, a space navigator, but um, I, I, I've never really worked out how to use it fluently. And then anyway, it kind of stopped working. It, it's, it's refusing to work um, in, in Firestorm. It refused to work for Firestorm for quite a while. And somebody then um, gave a, a tip that apparently if you uninstalled the, the space navigator drivers, um, then um, it then works in Firestorm. So I did that um, and it did work. Um, but that that trick doesn't seem to work anymore for me now. So so in in Stonewall, I I just use mouse and mouse smoothing. Um, I think there might have been one shot that I used the navigator for because I needed a a perfectly horizontal pan, which you can't really do um, without the navigator. But other than that, it was all just um, keyboard and mouse. As far as camera move, may I say something, Stara? Yeah. As far as camera movements go um, and controlling that, this is another good time to think about choreography systems. Um, I know that when we were doing the Black and Mirror, Rescene lets you build camera movement controls into your sequences, um, which is can be really interesting. Um, we got some interesting, uh, and I don't know whether the, some of the, the, the newer systems, the ones that are spot on that everyone uses, I'm not entirely sure if it lets you do... Um, <clears throat> build camera movements in, but we did stuff filming when um, we would put an invisible, we would have the choreography of all the movements in the scene and all the little micro animations we had people controlling in the, in the, uh, in the choreography, facial expressions, gestures, whatever, timed precisely. And we put an invisible actor in the scene, walking through the scene with the actual visible actors, and that was the camera person. It was like putting an invisible dolly camera that you could do whatever you wanted to into your sequence. Um, mm. And I don't know if that's something that people, I, I haven't done this in a while, so that sort of thing. Yeah, just wearing an invisible avatar and plunking them down. Even if you're a choreography system, and like I said, I'm out of sure which ones do this right now. Mm -hmm. Several years ago, I used to and animate just program. prims and let the prims uh, slide a certain way and hook my avatar to that, or the actor's uh, avatar, so the head would move really slowly, which looks great. And yeah. uh, uh, camera huts and systems, and I love the moon dust one. You can like in a real TV studio or. Uh, movie studio you can just make pre shots and it's really easy to do you know you feed it uh, what's it called Bar barometer I'm Dutch I my English is sometimes failing but you feed it the exact points of views that you want and you just click with a hut one two seven twelve that's mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. there's share. some really good ways in second life to move your camera yeah yeah but having said that about the space navigator, I use that a lot, especially for static shot. Because you uh, freeze the camera, any spot you want, and go back to that spot, you know, with escape. So if you let your avatar walk past in the screen, then use your space navigator. You don't need to move the camera. And for zooming in and out, it's, it's still the best, I find. Very strong. Yeah. It is. It is. It's. It, if you want camera movement, it's definitely the way to go. And and you're right that it can be used for static shots as well. But I, I think you can uh, down. There's a very nice trick to it. Uh, you just put a, a coin on top of it. You put it on the most sensitive movement, and you put your camera up way high, and then you put a coin on top of it, and it will slowly, slowly, slowly sink. Oh, and I love that. Movements. Yeah, it's like a drone. Mm. Someone had said something, asked about Rescene, I thought I saw in chat. I just wanted to mention, I don't believe that that's in development anymore. There are other really good choreography systems out there. Rescene is from a good while ago, and I don't believe that that... <clears throat> I was just mentioning it for reference, not suggesting it, because I don't think it's in development. 
I think this is a discussion that could go on and on. There's there's a whole lot to uh, to talk about here, and I'm hoping that Chantelle will get Machinima Mondays going again, so Definitely. that we could and maybe I'm... get together and talk about stuff because I think it'd be really really useful. We have guest speakers and we have different themes, but also. Really, for I think if you're new to machinima, you've been to this meeting tonight, yeah, a bit much, yeah, because we're all experienced machinima makers. It's very difficult to go back to the beginning, yeah. And with Machinima Mondays, you're free to join, there's never any charge. There's a Facebook group where you can uh, post your work and ask for feedback. And I think we'll have many guest speakers again. Maybe Huckleberry would be doing us the honor, yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay, see, and there's many more people here that uh, I'll be uh, bugging. <laughs> I put this screen up um, that someone's clicking through frantically, I don't know who, but the idea was to show you how we made storyboards. It's so easy. It, can you stop clicking through, whoever's clicking through, because I'm just going to do it. This is part of my process in when I was doing Black and Mirror, but used it for other things as well. And what we did was we planned out what the shots were going to look like and where the camera was going to move, what direction it was going to move in. And how it was going to move so that people could because I wasn't filming myself, I was just directing. I needed to be able to give the camera people the directions they needed. So the arrow would show when I wanted them to zoom in or whether when I wanted them to move the camera. And the different. I remember we also built needed. a we also built a clapper HUD during that that was on every every camera person's screen so that starting at each shot everyone had the same time code timestamp on their screens uh, for, yeah. for helpful, I think. Yeah, it worked with clapper boards, yeah. Yeah. Does anybody work with uh, the share your camera HUD? So that they see what you see, then they know what we, 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 we have that, that yeah. Because yeah, that's, I'm happy to hand them out if anybody wants it. We, we had a, a studio program, I can't remember its name, that we used. But now you can, of course, use things like Skype and just move between shared screens. I find they, they eat your frame rate if you do the outside ones, Discord. That's the trouble, yes. So it's so easy to explain to your actors that you, you know, this is what you're going to do, and then they know. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and you're going to, you're me. going to walk along here, and the camera is going to follow you. Okay. Monica wants it. Let's see. Do oh oh oh! I'm clicking things I shouldn't click. <laughs> if your screen moves, it's me. <laughs> Don't worry, you can. So, um, we've basically come to the end of our hour, and I think we've had some interesting stuff here. Does anyone have any questions? Scooby, you said you had a question about spot on. Type que if you've got any questions, type them into chat. Uh, 
know who, who else hit that, but there's probably people in the room who are much better familiarity with the uh, spot on than I, because um, uh, I haven't done this in a year or two. But um, I don't know specifically what you mean, but broadly, I say I don't see why not. Um, you can, I mean, spot on lets you move people around in whatever UA you want to, according to very precise timing, and animate them on the on the way and do a lot of very interesting control. I mean, so much of the choreographed dance shows that you've seen are using spot on or bespoke systems like it. Um, and it was startling what you can actually do with it and how cool it can be. I was playing with it. Subject, of course, to lag and, and latency and things like that, you know, but I suspect that you could. Nikira, what we'll be doing over the next year is finding machinimas that we can show as part of the festival um, so that we could show some um, video artists and video stories and, you know, that people can actually, um, what we'd like people to do is shoot at the fair as well. That's going to be tricky because um, of the lag and problems with that. But if people can experiment and maybe make machinima that can be shown by the end of the fair next year, that would be cool. And in fact, if people go out and shoot now and have footage that they can use, that would be very interesting. Yes. Yes. You don't even need to buy fraps. If you have screen recording software, you put up your second live screen and if you want to get rid of all the text and all the names, you just do well in Firestorm Storm. It's Control Alt and F1. And to bring back your text, of course, you do the same thing. So make a note of it. And then just make some recordings and, and film your own avatar walking around. Yeah. Well, maybe we could combine the two. But we were thinking films that were filmed at Fantasy Fair. Yeah. There's so much to see here. You're just walking around. Uh, last night I was knocked over by a tiny in a little car. And I, I laughed, you know. Things like that. You should have your your camera running all the time here. It's so beautiful and special. So it's mm -hmm. a very good place to start. And you do not always need a storyline to start out with. Everybody has a different perspective and it's all valid. I'll just add um, that that uh, key combination, Control Art F1, was something that I didn't know about when I, uh, and uh, it was one of the it was one of my eureka moments, um, so I'll just add to that, that Shift, Alt and H gets rid of your HUDs uh, and yeah. gives you a completely clear screen. Uh, again, something which I wish I'd known uh, earlier on um, and hadn't been just basically just taking all my HUDs off in order to, um, to get a clear screen. I think we ought to have what I wish I'd known. <laughs> because yeah. I think we all discover things as we're making machinima. But yeah. that was very much the focus of my tutorials, really, that I was, I was putting down all the stuff that I wish I'd known um, you know, fr from the start. Yeah. Gia Meeks passed away. Oh, my God. Oh, you didn't know. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, he passed away. He had a heart attack. Yes. Oh, um, that's so sad. Yes, very He made a lot of films and he did a lot of streaming also ahead of his time. Mm. I didn't realize how much work he did. He was a very quiet guy, very much his own man. He wouldn't communicate yeah. with people, but he was always there. He did all the Lauren Wayland stand-up shows. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. he was a generous man, yeah. Yeah. That's such a shame. Yes. Yes. 
Wayland left Second Life. He he said, now that I finally got a girlfriend, you know, with his New York accent, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ruin it by being in here every night. <laughs> and he did it. <laughs> I've never seen him come back. Such, oh, I miss him dearly. Yeah, he found it all his, all his life, yeah. Mm. Yes. You just yeah. hit, uh, yes, you just hit the hot keys again. Or oh, even easier, I think if you hit escape, it'll. Yeah. Yes, they're toggles, those hot keys. Mm. Yes, we showed that one here earlier this week, Judy. You did the main character in it, and Lauren, who's sitting here. Is Lauren still here? Oh, that's Lauren. Yes, there's yeah. Lauren. He did the music. Lauren composed a lot of music for my films. I was very lucky there. <laughs> but we had some fun, didn't we, guys? I counted it. I made over 100 productions. And with starting a new Vimeo account, I found 40 good enough <laughs> to put on there. So YouTube has it all. I actually found an interesting one, uh, uh, Sophia. With being yes. here for Life for uh, Life, I was asked about 11 years ago to make a machinima explaining uh, a mammogram van in uh, the county of Oman, where they cannot uh, explain. Oh, yes how and what to expect so they wanted an animation and we filmed it in Second Life and that was shown on TV in Oman how wonderful. very carefully and it uh, it saved a lot of lives because the husbands would then allow the wives to go there and have to mm. taken. So as in, in cancer prevention <laughs> cinema can be used for that too you know mm -hmm. That's, that is so good. Thank you, Jilly. Thanks, Jilly. Well, perhaps we could do a retrospective of Geo next year. Yeah. Thankfully, last this year's perspective, um, this year's um, recipe in terms of the retrospective is very much alive. Mm. Yes, it would be good to do that. So, does anyone have any more questions before we wrap this up? Ah, excellent, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Thank Lauren, you. you should watch the movie that Huckleberry Hacks made. They made a full-length movie. That's, uh, oh, I enjoy that really much. You will enjoy that. It is very, very impressive. I watched it uh, yesterday, the whole film again. Have you got the link? Here it comes. Hi, Chris. <laughs> now, Chris is from another um, Machinima platform. We met on TM Underground. And there's a whole bunch of Machinima makers, mostly American guys, but some outstanding good women. <laughs> and <laughs> very, very strong community for Machinima. Yes. In all different platforms. It was a long time. Never forget. Yes, it was a long time ago. You did some great work there, Chris. 
Oh, I'm still working on stuff, but not as much as I used to. Yes. Meetings, won't you, Chris? And then we'll well, you know, the, the, I did film in SL for a little while, but it was a lot of work. It was very time consuming to do a 20 minute piece, you know, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's hard to do story based the cinema in SL because it's like directing in real life. Basically, everybody has to be at the right spot when you need them, cue their lines, and uh, everything has to come together. Did you film the Lucas farm, did you, or James? Yeah. What's that? What's it's that? usually very it? difficult to do with a crew of volunteers. I'm sorry, I keep stepping on you, Chantal. Go ahead. No, uh, I'm stepping on you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. Uh, some of that we did for 20 minutes took us... Because it was a first time 15 hours of work, you know, and, it, and we weren't able to produce it because the person that filmed it, his computer crashed and burned, and basically we uh -huh. lost all the footage. Yeah. But we were Definitely. doing a comp. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. We, had, we were doing a comedy in SL, and it would have been really funny if we could have produced it. And at the time, Meta Metaverse wanted to pick it up. It just didn't work out. You know, where I said we lost all the footage. Oh. There's definitely a set of issues that SL has that you don't find in the real world. Oh, yeah. And well, what, I, the other way too. what I work with now is software that's in real life, and I create everything. All the content in my films are created by me, and all i got to do is get VO actors to VO it, voiceover actors, but voice over the, the parts. So it's a lot easier than having to direct somebody in a cell. Yeah, and what software do you use? Do you I'm use using iClone, iClone 7 right now. Oh, yeah. Now, I find that difficult, but we have a different uh, background. Well, that that's the thing. Filming and creating, you know, what you want is, is totally different. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm creating the avatars, I'm creating the scenes, I'm building the sets, you know, everything is done through iClone, and, and uh, the voiceovers, it's actually lip sync. the avatars are lip sync to the voiceovers, so they're able to speak, make hand movements, gestures, you know, you can get all that, and uh, walking, it's just, it's kind of like SL as far as you're putting in something into the avatar to make it do what you want, just like you do on a res ball here. You know, but it's it's different because it's in the avatar itself. Interesting. It's, it's not. I just did a film, and I think Santel saw it. It was maybe 15, 20-minute film. It took me a year to create it. So it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question um, on the floor about comparison between Vimeo and YouTube. Um, Safia is saying um, YouTube algorithms are brutal on library music. They will, yep. In, yep, they'll insist on adding video or adding ads to your video and then make you prove that you do actually have rights to use that library music. So you end up doing a lot of paperwork that yep. you don't have to do on Vimeo, and, and I personally feel it's better anyway. Vimeo doesn't go after copyright issues at all. Yeah. All right. YouTube does. Anything that could be copyrighted, they'll, they'll go after you for it. Um, I'm surprised I got away with uh, Death Race Frankenstein, because it's Death Race. It was made after Death Race, you know, it's basically somewhat like Death Race. And I'm surprised they didn't hit me with a copyright issue. On, on that, but I said it was a tribute to uh, Corman, who made Death Race, and I basically I also said that I wasn't making any money off of it, because that's their stickler about YouTube, that you're making a profit off of somebody else's material. Right, right. Where and and that's legit when you're using copyrighted stuff, but they don't stop to ask, do you have the license to use it? They just assume right. you don't. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And some of the music I used in there, I created. 
and they, they argued to me uh, okay. about that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Lauren had the same. And last week, Phelan Fairchild was here showing her machinima, the first one. She used the Year of the Tiger, you know. Boom, mm -hmm. boom, boom. She used that music. And I was streaming it. While she was uh, showing it on YouTube, I was muting my audio because I knew my stream would be blocked. And this was coming from YouTube and going mm -hmm. back to YouTube. I thought I better yeah. play it because that's it. Yeah. Yeah, they'll hit you with copyright. The only thing they do is they hit you with a warning, basically saying, but if your channel is nonprofit anyway, there ain't much they can do about it. They'll just tell you that it's copyrighted, you can't use it, blah, blah, blah. And uh, they're letting you know that you can't make a profit off of it, which I already know that. You know, but that Vimeo doesn't go after you for copyright issues at all. It tends to accept that if you've got the license and you've said in the description you've got the license, you're that's okay. But yeah. I don't know about which country uh, posting from. We have several countries here that things get posted from to YouTube, I imagine, and it seems the same thing happens from all of those. Yeah. Well, in Go by Metallica streamed one of their live concerts for the. Well, they streamed. They did a concert for stream, and they were blocked by YouTube within five minutes. Oh God! So their, their own concert. Their own concert. Oh, music. <laughs> this happened a few months ago. <laughs> it is funny, actually. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, I, the trouble is, I think all of us are doing our level best to use license, to be licensed, properly licensed, and not to use anything that is going to break licensing agreements. Well, the problem is, is, is they don't want anybody making money off of somebody else's content because they don't want to be sued. That's what it all that, comes down to. That's understandable. Yeah. And and while we're doing as Safia says and, and doing our best not to uh, violate any copyright issues, there are a lot of people who don't care. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't realize I had uh, people saying, but I bought the CD. I say, okay, and now you you you, you gotta prove it now. always right. CD. They really don't know, but if you explain, it's a learning curve. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're going as far as sound and music now. When you go into these websites that are royalty free, you got to pay for the licensing of using that music. And now mm -hmm. you can get that music for free. Then they say, oh, by the way, you got to pay for the licensing if you're going to use it. All right where you're going to make money doing it. Oh, yeah, which, sure. You know, which think, is understandable. I think there was a problem with, um, that Lauren and I hit with some music that Lauren had properly licensed, and then it was sold to Getty Images. The library was sold to Getty Images, and they started saying, you've got to take this music down because it belongs to us now. You don't have a license with us. And that was awful. Well, here's the way I look at it. If you're not making any money off of it, what does it matter? Okay? If you're not making any money, you're actually advertising their music or whatever you're putting on your film. So why does it matter if you're not making a profit? If you make a profit, I can see them saying, hey, I want my cut. You know, I understand that because I was a musician for 12 years in real life. I was a singer. And believe me, you know, copyright is a big thing when it comes to music. They don't play around. And as a DJ, same thing. You better make sure your titles are clean because SL is coming down on a lot of people right now because of copyright problems. So it's the same in filming as well as it is an entertainer or anything that has to do with that type of business. Nonprofit means you're not making nothing, so you're not getting anything for the work. Well, 
actually theoretically non-profit means that, but we're all here supporting an event, Relay for Life, right. which is making a hell of a lot of money, and they are technically yeah. a non-profit. Money can flow mm -hmm. even in a non-profit concept. Con oh, yeah. There's a CEO that makes money. There's a CEO and everybody that works under them that makes money. They get paid to do it. Yeah. From the money they collect. Yeah. Oh, I agree I, with that. I think one of the problems is um, that, that I, I, I don't make money or intend to make money from my machinima, but um, but my machinima is on my website, and on my website there's also my books, and my books are for sale uh, mm -hmm. at Amazon. So there's also that link of indirect um, um, commercialization so that whilst you might not be making any money directly from the from the machinima it's possible that the machinima might indirectly promote other things that you do make money from mm -hmm. so, you know what you know what I'd say to them in response your music's getting played and they might buy your CD right okay that's what they don't phantom that when people hear it and they like it they might go and purchase it so honestly they're not paying you to advertise it it works both ways. Actually, I did buy CDs and music because I heard it in, in films and machine. Right, yeah. right. Yep. So, Second Life concerts from musicians, uh, which music was used in a machinima. I think, actually, I want to plead for that. We should do that much more, much more often. No, well, the, pro the, pro uh, the problem is the music studios are greedy, okay, point blank. And, and honestly, you know, the musicians want their money. They worked hard for that money. They also went and got a master's degree in music to perform. And they want their cut. But the problem with studios is they want it all. They're, they're the one taking the chance with their money. They, this is how they put it. We're taking a chance putting you on tour, putting your music out there. We're paying for it all. We want the money in return come back. I understand that, but what I want to say to them, at one time, they used to pay DJs in real life, but they called payola to play their music, all right? In other words, get their music played on those radio stations. Now, if somebody's playing their stuff and they're not collecting money off of it, they're getting free advertising, plain and simple. And for them to come down on somebody that's not making a profit off their music is pretty stupid to me because you're getting free advertising. And people hear it, and then they'll perhaps purchase it, or see it, either way. Mm -hmm. But that's my take on it. Yes, and Paola did go on for decades, believe me, you're right. Dorian, responding back to your original question about the advantages of Vimeo or YouTube, leaving aside the whole music issue, um, I do think the quality of Vimeo is better. Yeah, I agree with you, because I'm on both accounts. The only thing is, a lot of people watch YouTube instead of Vimeo. That's the only downside of it. Yeah, that's better exposure. And another thing, uh, I've had that with Art Machinima. Uh, if you have nakedness, nipples. <laughs> Yeah. Second one. Yeah. Uh, if you cross uh, the little thing in YouTube that it's not made for children, they will allow it. And Vimeo is strict. Mm. Um, yeah. So that that anyway. And the well, you, you know how the cinema uh, person that makes a cinema film can protect themselves. Put a rated R rating before your film. Warn them. <laughs> Just like they do in real movies. I do. It. Okay. Hey, um... The other thing I find about Vimeo is it's a lot harder to find videos unless you have the direct link or you have a clear idea of the path you want to follow. Right. Yeah. Uh, YouTube right. makes it very easy to yeah, find stuff just type and in. recommend stuff. Vimeo doesn't do that. Ah, that's an idea. 
Mm -hmm. The only thing is, you got to get permission from that artist. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming to this event. We've overrun a bit. Uh, but it's been so interesting. Dawny's been live streaming it, and there will be a backup uh, that people can watch if they want to check over things. And I'd like to thank Ash and Chantel and Huck for joining me here today because it's been so great. And what I've loved about doing this little film festival has been the sheer enthusiasm of people. It's been great that so many people have come along, talked about it, found out about things, hopefully been inspired. One last thing I would say is all of this has been because of Fantasy Fair and Relay for Life. And there was a kiosk at the back, and I would love it if you could go and put some lindens in that kiosk as a thank you for the film festival. <laughs>